My name is Laura Patsko. I work in the ELT Research and Teacher Development Team for Cambridge University Press. And if you don't already know me, just a brief introduction. Um, my background is in linguistics. I'm, I'm an applied linguist, predominantly a sociolinguist, uh, with interests in various areas, but my, my three sort of specialist areas are in pronunciation teaching in English as an international language or lingua franca and in effective pedagogy. And it's the third area which I'm going to talk to you about today. So, you might recognize me from the marketing materials. This is me with my colleague Claire, who is currently giving a fascinating presentation that you're all missing in a room nearby. And we work together in the same team, but on slightly different areas. So where Claire and uh, the people that she manages work on corpus linguistics, so they look at how language is used, both by experts and by learners, I look at how language is taught and how it's learned. So I do the pedagogy research side, she does the language research side. And that basically involves three main areas. Basically we either consult existing research or we commission research if we need to, or we conduct it ourselves. And there are different reasons why we do those different things. So this is what I'm going to be explaining to you in this presentation. And I'm also going to tell you a little bit about what we do with that. So it's great to consult literature and commission and conduct research. That gives us amazing insights. But they're only useful if we then take those insights and put them into the materials or the training that we provide, or if we share those insights with a wider audience. If you've had a chance to read the abstract, and I have to read quote myself here, I asked some questions. I asked, how many ways are there to teach or learn a language? What materials, techniques, tools, approaches, and attitudes are involved? And how can we know which combination is best for a particular learner in a particular context? And I'm hoping that you're here because you thought, oh, those are good questions, I want to know the answers. And I'm not going to tell you the answers. Because like all good questions, the answer is, it depends. Learning and teaching is highly context specific. And that's why I love my job so much, because I learn so much about the different contexts that people like you all work in and how language learning looks in those places and how it doesn't look, because I'm surprised every day by what I find. So we have to strike a balance. We're trying to balance learning about how humans learn anything and how they learn language in general, and then more specifically, how they learn it in particular contexts. So we'll start with why we might consult research, because of course, we're not new. As an industry, we've been around at least in CUP for 42 years. How old are you, Rupert? 43. <laughs> 43 years. 21 years. Forever 21. No, but obviously there's a lot of research already out there, so why not make the most of it? That's why it's published, because so many great questions are being asked. People are trying to find the answers, they publish those answers, and then we can learn from each other. So there's no need to reinvent the wheel, and sometimes we're trying to discover something which has already been investigated quite thoroughly. So when that happens, we consult the literature. We go to the field, to our fellow experts, and find out what they can teach us. Some examples of this, I'm just going to give you a few examples of each of these things because of course there are a million and one questions. So I'll start with just three questions that I've been asked in the past year and a half approximately by people around the press or within our sister organizations. Things which they felt that they could find an answer to if only they had access to the right research and so they came to our team. So the first of which what difference does it make if a learner reads from a printed page or on a screen? I'm going to interpret that sound as an interesting question. <laughs> and it does make a bit of a difference. I could spend all day talking just about this topic. But one example which I can give you, which is something that surprised me and which I found in existing research literature, was the difference between these two formats. And I, I don't know how well you can see that image, but this was in a journal article from 2008 to try to illustrate the difference between when text is fixed on a screen, and if there's more text, you just go to the next screen, versus when text scrolls. So like a website, generally, you just keep scrolling and scrolling. I won't ask you your preference, but can you just raise your hand if you yourself have a preference for reading in one of these ways, if you've thought about it before? Oh, quite a few of you, okay. And research suggests, as you can see, that most people prefer not to scroll, Subjectively, that's what people report. They say they don't like scrolling for various reasons. What's interesting when we start to read the research literature is that objectively, there's some suggestion that this also could negatively affect recall. So people can't remember what they read or where it was. 
and possibly therefore comprehension. So in a second language context where everybody does a lot of reading around the world, even conversation courses and so on, pe people are reading all the time and increasingly in digital formats, we need to be sensitive to how this might be perceived by a learner and how it might affect their learning. And you'll notice I'm using might a lot because again, these questions and their answers are very elastic and context is very important. The second question somebody asked me was, how do stories help younger learners acquire a second language? And you'll probably realize that there is an implicit assumption here, which is that stories help children acquire a second language. It's quite intuitive. Stories are universal. Every culture through history has stories, verbal if not written, often both. So we sort of know that they work, we feel that they work, but how? What is it about them that's so useful? If we're producing new materials for children using stories, what should we keep and what isn't required? We know, for example, that the best learning of a language from a story for children comes from some kind of interaction. And that doesn't necessarily mean listen to a story and then interact with a peer. It means interaction with the story. So whether they're being read to or whether they're reading, there needs to be some involvement. What do you think? Have you ever felt that way? What would this character say? Pointing at the picture and so on. And I really like this quotation that children need encouragement to make meaning rather than take meaning. And stories are a fantastic way to do this and to develop second language learning and first language learning. And then a third question somebody asked me was, what are the effects of testing on teaching when preparing young learners or younger pupils for international English language exams? And again, where to begin? <laughs> Could spend all day talking just about this, and I'm sure uh, some of our colleagues from assessment would know more about this than I do. But we often talk about this concept of a wash back, that having a test at the end of a course is washing back over the rest of the course. And I think we often assume that that's negative, and it can be, of course, and again, consulting the literature suggests that there are potential risks that, for example, the course will only cover language which is going to be tested. However, if your test is designed to genuinely assess whether someone of any age can use that language appropriately in the given context, then if you only focus on things in that test, your classroom practice still could be very beneficial and very developmental. So again, it's a, it's a nuanced picture but it's really important to ask these questions from people who know about it, and nobody is an expert on everything. So quite a big part of what we do is consulting the collective expertise of our industry. And that way, everybody learns something, and we can all move forward. And we don't lose a lot of valuable time asking the same questions and finding the same answers as people who've already done that. These are all questions that I was asked internally, and the answers were given internally. They were fairly small questions, even if they were on big topics. And we started to realize that a lot of the insights we were gathering and the experts that we were working with really had something of great value for the wider industry. So we're going to actually publish some of these in the next couple of weeks, I hope. They'll be available on the website. So just to give you an idea of some of the papers in the range that we've commissioned, the idea is the same as I said before. It's to review, to consult the existing expertise in the field and put it together in a way that is accessible to busy people, but interested people. So we've got what's new in ELT besides technology, which Silvana contributed to. We've got blended language learning, which is written by Annie King, who's a fellow of the University of Cambridge, and she's presenting on Friday morning. We've got visual literacy in English language teaching, which Ben Goldstein wrote, and he will be here, I believe, this evening. And then we have personalization of language learning through mobile technologies, which Agnes here contributed to, or wrote entirely. Sorry, Agnes, <laughs> full credit where it's due. So all of these are, like I say, attempts to review what we already know so that we can make informed decisions about what to do next. Now, sometimes, the literature doesn't quite answer the question we've got. Maybe our question's a little bit more specific about a particular context or about a particular type of learner. Or it could be that we have a question about something which is very new or for some other reason is very under-researched. And in that case, we commission something. So we will say to somebody, well, can you try and do a little bit more on this? Because what we need can't be answered by what is already out there. So some examples. How is technology used to teach and learn English in Brazil? So this is one question that we thought was interesting and 
Brazil is a huge market for Cambridge University Press. We have, our courses are very popular there. We have a number of relationships with institutions and learners there. And technology is also a hot topic and we wanted to understand better how it's currently being used or not. And we had a contact who was doing her PhD at a university in Sao Paulo on this topic. And so we commissioned a kind of mini PhD summary from her, as nobody has time to read 200 pages, even her supervisor. And so she put together the kind of highlights for us and discussed it with us and spoke to us about what is really important to know if we're working with that market on this topic. And again, just the highlights. Uh, I learned from this report that 54% of the Brazilian population is online. And considering that Brazil has a population of about 200 million, 54% of that is quite a lot. And that 65 million Brazilians are on Facebook, which is second only to the United States of America, which I also didn't know. So there are also a number of new government initiatives to integrate technology in schools. And it seems like from all of this, you would expect quite a high level of integration and sophistication and familiarity with using technology. But as Silvana was talking about, training is a massive issue. And what Clara's research suggested was that even with the best motivation in the world, teachers aren't always prepared to use technology appropriately in their teaching. Or sometimes they're prepared, but the infrastructure isn't ready because what they're trying to do is really new. And that's exciting, but it means there's still development to be done. This was another question that came in the development of a new course, is what challenges do English learners face if their first language is a specific language? So I've listed three here, just as an example. And what do they have in common? Because of course, we're in the business of producing course materials and we're always trying to strike a balance between making those materials widely applicable and generally usable and also recognizing that everybody has a different context and that the first language influence on the second language can be huge and those expectations that you bring from your first to your second language can really affect the way that you learn it and the way that it could be taught effectively. So what we're trying to do when we develop courses, particularly if they're going to be used significantly in particular markets, is work out how to make them as personal as possible in their application and still make them relevant to many people. Because it takes a lot of work to make and to train and to deliver uh, course materials. But the thing that stood out to me particularly, I was reviewing this recently, was that the organization of written texts, especially in academic contexts, has some things in common between these apparently very different languages and also some differences, but the commonalities and the differences weren't what I would have expected. So for example, um, Arabic and Turkish both use repetition and express certainty a lot more strongly than English would. And Korean tends to give more background information before stating the main argument. So as compared to English, where there tends to be more hedging, less direct language, the message stated clearly and then explained through the rest of the paper. This can make a huge difference to how the learner goes about expressing themselves in writing in English. And this kind of insight complements the insights that the other part of our team bring from corpus linguistics about the structure of language. So where Claire and the people she's working with are looking at how words are used, how they're put together, their particular meanings, on a bigger level, I might be looking at skills, for example, listening or reading or literacy, or something which isn't easily represented in a corpus, or it is but not fully. And we're trying to put those insights together to find the most relevant approach for a book that's going to be used in many markets. And finally, this is a very hot topic, adaptive technology. Everybody wants to know more about it. Almost nobody knows anything about it because it's just too new. We're all new, we're all learning. It's a very new area, particularly in language instruction. And so we thought, well, why don't we look at this from a different angle? A lot of people are asking about the technology, but it's always important to remember to keep pedagogy before technology, so technology can serve learning. So we thought, what if we frame the question differently? What if we ask about the effective teaching and learning practices and how the technology might replicate those? instead of saying, what can the technology do, as a first question. And so we commissioned a report from an expert on effective teaching. And the most interesting thing that came out of his report for me was a reference to passion and credibility. He says, effective teachers demonstrate passion and are seen to be credible. And of course, this raises a question, how can technology appear to be passionate? 
Credible maybe, people believe in technology when it works. So this tells us something quite apart from the language learning and teaching process and the language structure, that there's a functionality issue. Just as people are happy with their teachers when their teachers work, whatever that means, rewind to Silvana's plenary. So this idea of passion and credibility, how can that be represented in technology? Maybe it can't 100%. So then we come back to this old expression, which maybe you've heard before, that technology won't replace teachers, but teachers who use technology might replace teachers who don't. So again, it's just about looking at issues from a different perspective and trying to get as many interesting insights as we can to make the right decision to go forward. And then when our questions get very specific, we do it ourselves. Okay, so then comes the time to actually conduct research. And we do this uh, with our partner institutions and with teachers in local contexts. So we study things like implementation or impact. We're trying to find out when this material or when this training is employed in the institution, what happens? What happens next? What can we observe? And this is where I'd like to make a distinction between the research that I do, so pedagogy research, and market research, because we have a, a long-standing market research department who are very busy and excellent at what they do, and what they do predominantly is talk to people. You know them, you've met them, they've organized this conference. They get people together to share ideas and discuss and give predominantly subjective opinions, which are hugely valuable. One of the things that I try to do to complement that is provide more objective insights, and this means watching what people really do in addition to hearing what they say they do. And trying to work out if there's a gap, if there's any gap, how big is that gap, and so on. So when we conduct research with our partners, we learn some interesting things that they might not have reported, or what they've reported is only one side of the story. For example, so there are a number of people in the conference uh, this week, I believe, who work for a laureate university. They're a very big network of universities, and we've been working with them together for a number of years because they've been delivering and developing blended language courses. And this is a huge area for us, so it's a great opportunity for us to learn together. And the predominant purpose, according to the literature, of a blended language course, and specifically the face-to-face -face element, is to get students interacting in speech together. So you've got your sort of blended model, part of the course delivered face-to-face, -face, synchronously, and part of the course developed or delivered online, so studied individually. But what Laureate have done with this is they've put both parts online, and this is where it gets really interesting, because we're thinking, well, what happens to the interaction when it's all done online? It, it, does anything happen? Does it make a difference at all? We kind of imagine probably, but what is that difference? So we're trying to address two big questions, one of which is how interactive are the lessons, the face-to-face -face lessons in virtual classrooms in this context, and that's very important, uh, not only from our point of view, but also particularly from an institutional point of view for Laureate, to understand to what extent their teachers are enacting the methodology that they've been trained on. And then particularly from our perspective making materials, we want to know what activities appear to facilitate that interaction and what make it meaningful. So, over the course of about a year and a half, the teachers in uh, various institutions, but two in particular, have been sending recordings of their online lessons which four researchers, so me, a colleague at Laureate, and two freelancers who we've trained and standardized, we're all watching those lessons and keeping track of how the interaction is unfolding. So how many seconds, literally a number of seconds, how many seconds are being spent with students interacting together? How many seconds are being spent in silence or apparent confusion, not clear what's happening, which happens a lot in an online environment, I should say. How many seconds are being spent with the teacher talking to the students, just talking at them? And then looking at the student-student interaction in particular, what activities are facilitating that? And is it meaningful? Are the students simply reading a dialogue together, but maybe they don't know what they're saying? Or are they engaging in a natural conversation about each other's jobs or weekends or something? So we're almost finished collecting data. We've got a goal of 200 lessons, and today I added up 197. I was really hoping to tell you today that we've achieved our 200 goal, but we're almost finished. And we're learning a lot, and this will all be published in due course and shared. And the other case study I'd like to tell you about is a partnership with Embassy. 
who are, again, an international chain of private language schools, and they have a branch here in Cambridge. And we were working with them on this uh, particular course, this face-to-face -face course. So they've been using the face-to-face -face course for a number of years in print. Now there is an ebook version. And we were interested to see what difference, if any, this made to the teaching and learning in that context. And we also wanted this to be developmentally valuable for the teachers, because one of the key things that I try to do when I'm organizing projects like this is make sure that it's research with people and not simply research on people. So I'm trying to be a fly on the wall and observe things objectively, but equally, the people participating in that research and providing data are not just subjects, they're teachers and they're learners and they're people. And so we tried to set up this study in a way that would be developmentally useful for them. So we went and we observed them teaching using the print book. We went back and observed them teaching using the digital book. Same classes, same teachers, a month apart. So they had some time to become familiar with the new material. And we talked to them at every stage of the process. So before the implementation and during, after each lesson, and then at the end of the project, when I'd gone away and done some interpretation, I went back and said, what do you think of my interpretation? Because we're trying to answer these questions. Are there any differences between the two classroom contexts, which appear to arise as a result of the materials used. And what appear to be the effects of those differences? And these are quite hard questions to answer, and I didn't feel comfortable applying only my interpretation to that. I wanted the teacher's insights as well. So this is part of how we conduct these kinds of projects with our partners, because all the time we're trying to learn more so that we can improve incrementally each lesson, each course, each course book, and so on. And I can tell you, for example, in both of these contexts, maybe you can guess what the number one most crucial intervention I would suggest from both of these is teacher training. Any implementation, any change to practice, the teachers have got to be trained for it and reflect on what they're doing. It's not enough to move from one context to another. As Silvana was just saying, that doesn't mean the teachers become bad teachers or the learners become bad learners. That's not the case. But you need to adapt your skills. They don't just transfer automatically. And so that brings me to the last part of the presentation, just to summarize, because this is a very, very quick presentation of what I do. And I joined the press about 18 months ago. And I thought, well, this would be a fun exercise to kind of summarize the diversity and the range of the things that we do, the places we go, the people we talk to, and also all the fun we have. Because if you're just quite curious about teaching and learning, and you're lucky enough to have a job like mine, where you get to ask questions all day, and you're still allowed to say, well, I'm not sure about the answer, <laughs> then it's brilliant, and we have a lot of fun in our team. So just to give you an overview, and then we'll have a couple minutes for questions and answers, See what you make of this, the first 18 months of my job in numbers. There might be a little bit more coffee and cake than you expected. Yes. <laughs> okay, so I'm being a little bit facetious to end the presentation, but just to give you an idea of the diversity of the job, it, it's not something that's easy to explain in 25 minutes, but I hope that I've given you a kind of taste of what's included, what's involved in what we do. Thank you very much. Thanks, Laura.